Hello, everybody. Is everybody here that we're presenting to? Yep. Perfect. Well, in that case, it's fine. Um, my name is Martin Barber, representing QSC Audio today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about and present QSIS, which is um, QSC's network system uh, integration system. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about everything, because quite frankly, it's a huge product, uh, and we've all seen DSP systems before. This is actually a third generation product, so I want to focus on just a couple of the things which really make it unique and stand out amongst uh, the crowd. So just as a way of a brief overview, um, QSIS is a centralized signal processing system. By that I mean we have distributed I.O. boxes which live on an Ethernet network. That all communicates over a standard gigabit Ethernet network to a core device. The core is responsible for processing all the audio, it receives all the audio, it presses all the control signals, it serves up all the control interfaces, and it communicates with the outside world. So the core is really the management interface for the network. So it, the system being developed specifically to work with and exist on shared network environments. So that's one of the first topics I want to talk about. We have implemented um, a network protocol suite which we're calling QLAN. It's not a proprietary network at all. In actual fact, it's quite the opposite. It's um, a collection of open Ethernet standards which have been combined in such a way that give us high performance, low latency audio over a network, standard Ethernet network. Because it's been developed over standard Ethernet protocols, IT administrators know what it is and know how it works. So bringing it onto a shared network environment is actually completely painless. We go on there to um, network administrators understand how VoIP works, they understand how IPTV works, and when they see our system, it's like, well, I know how that works. Excellent. So they don't need to relearn everything. They don't need to change their way of working to work with our system. So it's a massive uh, move forward for a networked audio. It gives us um, a latency of just two and a half milliseconds from any input to any output across the network. And um, we have, it's a layer three based protocol. So we're able to spread our audio system across multiple subnets in a single environment, which is very important for a shared network environment. But in addition, to, in addition to that, because it's layer three, we're able to tunnel out of the building across multiple networks, even the internet, internet based on layer three. So our uh, maintenance contractor in America is not only able to log in and see the system in Australia, they can also listen to it and understand why it's not working, why it's getting the wrong source and the wrong output. So layer three networking enables us to do a huge amount more than what we have typically as an industry been used to as layer two networks. So that's the first unique thing about um, QSIS, which is really, really um, customer oriented and makes it a huge selling point. In terms of, from a, from a customer's perspective, they want high performance and reliability. Our system as an audio processor is actually built from standard IT components. If you take the lid off our device, it actually looks very much like a standard PC inside. It's running off Intel chips. Um, so we're able to take, for the first time in the audio industry, we're able to harness the power of the IT industry, which has got huge more resources than we ever will have. So we're able to take that, apply that to a massively powerful DSP system, and roll it out to the audio professional. So we're able to harness all the developments um, of the, both the IT industry and the networking industry to present a truly unified, high performance and reliable system to the customers. We've just, with them, in the last few months, we're launching version two of our system. QSIS originally went to the market at uh, Infocom to last year. So within 15 months, we've moved on to what is now our second generation software, which is integra integration and introduction of networked paging systems. So we have network paging devices on the, on the network, all talking the same QLAN protocol suite that we discussed. Each paging station has the ability to facilitate an extra microphone input along with a line output. So if you imagine um, an airport terminal, for example, we have a standard microphone for paging to the area. We also have an auxiliary microphone input onto the network, which could be used as an ambient sensing microphone for that area. So we don't need to run long cables back to rack rooms. Moving on now to redundancy, which was a huge, um, huge thinking point. And it was something very, very fundamental to the development of the product. 
With other systems, particularly distributed DSP systems, we've often had to build complex DSP systems and duplicate those into multiple devices. We then have to create complex control links between those independent systems so that the system as a whole knows what to do if some part of that fails. The long shot of that is that it's complex programming, very, very time consuming, and it's very easy to get wrong. What the approach we've taken with QSIS is by having a centralized processing system, that does everything. So if we want to protect our system, we just duplicate that one bit. So for us to implement redundancy, we take a second core and put that also on the Ethernet network. And that can be anywhere on the network. And in the design software, we simply say, this is my design, make it do redundant with a right click, and we give it the name of the backup core. And from that point onwards, it takes the entire design file and uploads it to both cores. Those cores will then synchronize each other a thousand times a second, staying in sync. One is active, one's dormant. The primary fails, the backup one takes over. It's a really very simple process, but we've never in the audio industry had such a simple redundancy implementation. So not only can we implement redundancy for our core audio processing, but we can implement it in exactly the same way for all of our inputs and outputs. So we can decide at the design stage which part components need to be dual redundant, and to make them dual redundant is literally a two-click process. It's extremely easy by comparison to what we've been used to in the past. So, as I say, as a DSP system, it's very difficult to um, give you a complete overview in this short five-minute presentation, but over on the stand, we have a working, live, completely fault-redundant system, which I'll be happy to show any of you through. But for now, that's kind of a PowerPoint or anything to work with. That kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to present to you. So thanks for your time. Have you well, any questions at yes, all? Yes, I do actually. Um, you noted that you've managed to harness the, the benefits of the IT and networking industry in, yes. the, in the product. Have you harnessed their low pricing as well? Um, I try not to get involved in pricing. <laughs> but, but, I, but I also appreciate that's a bit of a cop out. Um, what we can do is as the IT industry evolves, we will be able to increase the power and the um, abilities of those components without increasing the cost. So as RAM becomes less expensive, as processors become less expensive, we can turn that into more powerful systems without increasing price. What, what, um, what audio, uh, audio converters do you use? Because obviously that's not a, an IT We have bit. two different microphone line input card options. We have a standard line input card, which is microphone and line inputs on a single card. Um, which would be more than adequate for most applications. We then have a, what we call a high performance, which would be more broadcast studio oriented uh, input options. So depending upon what your application, you can choose which type of input you need to use. Okay, on a, on a, a large scale job like a, you know, a stadium or something, price wise, how would it compare with its competition like SoundWeb or, or Media Matrix? When you talk about the, um, the product itself, um, on face value, perhaps, the, again, not knowing too much about the pricing, the prices may not be favorable. But what we've gone a huge way to do achieving with um, QC is the ease of integration with the network. The design time is all being brought right down. So the final cost of the customer is probably better than a typical, than a comparable system from um, BSS or Media Matrix or Biom. So again, face value is probably not really fair to, to contrast because the amount of work required to make that system work is vastly different to what we have been used to as an industry, particularly when we're talking about systems which need to be dual redundant. Because as I say, we've gone from systems where it's taken weeks to make something work reliably on a large dual redundant system to literally a two-click process. So the, the cost savings are immense. A couple of questions about QLAN. Um, you said it's based, it's it's open, it's based on IT things. So, are there other manufacturers that can adopt QLAN to plug into your kit? We're not marketing QLAN as a product to sell to other manufacturers, purely because there are already other people out there doing similar things. That's not in our business model right now. But, as I say, we're not trying to do anything secret squirrel about it. It's it's nothing proprietary. It's just the way we've done it. And. Uh, other other protocols such as Cobanet, Dante, whatever, have, have limitations on switch hops mm -hmm. because of the whole nature of what you're trying right. to do. Uh, right. What limitations does QLAN have? As well, our, our network, um, our actual, the time it takes to get between devices is a 0.3 of a millisecond. Now we actually factor in a bit more than that. We give ourselves 0.6 of a millisecond 
from I.O. frame device to core device. So that, that extra buffer gives us the ability to get around about seven network switch hops on a gigabit network. Now if that's not enough, and often it isn't, I say often, sometimes it isn't, we can increase that buffer, which will give us um, a system-wide increased latency. But the important thing about it is that the latency is consistent and it's deterministic from the outset. With other products on the market, you may not know what your final latency will be until you've combined all those products onto the one network, you set it up and got it running. With ours, we know what it will be and we can, we can factor that in. Any analog input to any analog output across the entire network will always have the same latency. How many audio channels can you handle in the system? Our stand, we, the cores come in three sizes. Um, physically, it's the same unit, but there are three models in the range. A Core 1000 will support 64 inputs by 64 outputs across the network. Core 3000 will do 128 by 128, and the Core 4000 will do 512 by 512. Now those output counts are actually a minimum channel count. The I.O. frames have got, um, it would be unfair to say they're dumb I.O. boxes. In actual fact, there is some intelligence in them. If your design file requires the same audio at multiple outputs on the same I.O. frame, um, or in fact, if you're using a data port card which has some DSP on, on board, we can do band passed audio across the same I.O. frame with using a single network channel into the box. So for perhaps our box would support 16 outputs, but if we only wanted four independent audio feeds across multiple outputs on the same box, we'll only use four network channels. So we can reserve those 12 to be used elsewhere. So our largest core will, depending on how it's designed, could achieve 512 inputs by a few thousand, two, maybe two, two and a half thousand outputs. Yeah, but all the, all, the, all the channels go through the core. Everything goes through the core. That's how we achieve our deterministic latency and that's how we achieve the management of the system. So that core is really responsible for everything. I'm sorry, I missed that. Any analog input to any analog output will be 2.5 milliseconds. Um, if you're using AES cards, there's, there's no A to D, obviously, so we can achieve slightly quicker with the AES cards. The important thing is that by groups, they will always be time consistent. So an analog input to an analog output will always be fixed. An AES into an AES out will, again, will also be consistent across the network. I think if there's no other questions, I think that's where we're done on time now. So, Roland, are you, you done? All happy? All right. Brilliant. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barber.